I think it's really important right now that every worship leader, worship pastor is in tune with this right here. What are we singing? What are we saying? Welcome to Bible Memory Goal. My name is Josh, and you just heard from John Lilly. He is the worship arts pastor at Wood Creek Church in Richardson, Texas. And he's a good friend of mine. We've known each other for over a decade. We even, over COVID, did a cover of Psalm 46 by Shane Shane. Our conversation today is centered around worship. What does it mean to worship within the context of a church? And how does music and scripture memory work together? What is the importance of the lyrics of the words that we sing? There's so much that we cover here, and I hope that you'll take some time to watch all the way through. Let's go ahead and dive in with John Lilly. You're officially a, the worship pastor, right? Right. right. So we call it worship it, arts pastor. Worship arts pastor. Be, well, because worship is so much bigger than music, right? Yes. And now, one of my jobs and one of my opportunities is to teach that, to help people understand that worship is um, a life um, and not a song. Yeah, it's called Worship Arts Pastor because the focus discipline are the art forms. And in fact, even just saying that, so many people think of worship as the songs we sing on Sunday. And so I have the opportunity to expand well beyond that into any expression of faith that God's given us creatively to share our faith with this world, but to say thank you to God. Um, and that goes well beyond music, uh, throughout the arts, and then beyond that to what God's given us a passion for and a gifting for in this world. Yeah. So I get to encourage people to do that. So I'm the worship arts pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give an ex a couple of examples? Because I remember being at you know Wood Creek when you guys did like this art show, mm, which yeah. I thought that was really cool. It's like everybody. It was mostly everybody in the yeah. congregation, right? That had that had mm -hmm. art was showing it. That I think that's one yeah. example. What would be something else? Well, what's funny is we only did that once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it <laughs> but, seemed really. But the cool. reason is because. I tagged on a concert after it. Okay. And it was doing the festival and the concert, staying up till 3 a.m. on a Saturday into Sunday that I was leading oh that morning goodness. that I was like, mm, we might wait to do that one again. But it was fantastic. We called it Created to Create. Yeah. And so that was an opportunity to see that beyond the songs we sing on Sunday, that there are so many gifts and passions and talents God's given people, a creative spark He's put in them to share his faith with this world. And so uh, that, we got to just put it on display. So the, yeah, that arts festival was really cool. I think in other ways, you know, I, I think it's it's muscle memory and kind of giving people something new to um, join in yeah. uh, in terms of worship and corporate worship. Yeah. Um, and so absolutely Sunday is a critical time that we come together and worship. But I've also found um, we do something called Worship House. Mm -hmm. And it's seasonal. It's probably every couple months. Um, but we gather in worship in the round, whether it be in a different room of our church property um, or outside on the property. Or even um, the last one we did was at an elder's backyard. Like was he has it? a big old backyard. And we worship out there together. We have stuff for the kids to do with us in worship, but also they can be playing too. We want it to feel like this is a part of life. This isn't the thing you check out of life to go do once a week, mm -hmm. but this is the thing you're doing daily and consistently in community as you're, um, as you're honoring the Lord together in community. So worship house, really cool. Yeah, I think I'd been to one of those back when it was like behind the elementary or the kids area. By the playground and stuff. Yeah, yeah good times. I think that was really neat. And I love that what that it seems to do, like your focus on not just the music side of it is it allows people that maybe aren't musicians mm -hmm. or don't feel like they've got an ability to sing, which would like even include my wife. Sure. You know, that to be able to engage in some way. It provides a space definitely for people who music's not their natural inclination, but being in corporate worship together and practicing worship in different and unique ways. Again, kind of challenging the muscle memory we have. It's a yeah. big part of, I think, what Worship House and the other things we do in worship are about. So. So for you personally, how have you been able to stay engaged with 
the heart of worship, despite it being like this week in, week out, hey, this is your, this is almost like your, it is your job. Oh my right? gosh, man. That's got to have been something that's been a challenge over the course of the past decade or more that you've been doing this. Yeah. Gosh, what a great question. Um, there's no doubt that there are seasons when it takes a lot for me to get up there with genuine authenticity and worship the Lord. Yeah. You know, we call them dry seasons, whatever that may be. Or just when you get tired of the road, you know, I like things to change up. I like things to be different. And you look back and you say, wow, this is what, 33 weeks I've led consistently and we've been singing the similar and same songs. So, yeah, I mean, authenticity is a very important as a worship leader. There's a couple things I do uh, to maintain that relationship with the Lord and that relationship with the congregation that is honest and authentic. And one is we have um, we have this incredible. Uh, if you've heard of Every Moment Holy, yeah, that book. It's the or, a modern day daily prayer book. Yeah, written uh, and gosh, I'm so sorry to whoever wrote it. I can't remember your name right now, <laughs> um, but you're amazing. Uh, but there's one called Prayer Before Entering the Stage, or Prayer Before Getting on the Stage. Um, and the the idea of this prayer is something I, I pray consistently, uh, and we, we put it on the wall right before you walk onto our stage Sunday mornings. And that is, God, humiliate me for your glory. Like, make this about you first, because whatever I'm bringing uh, to this pales in comparison to what you're bringing, Lord. And it's in that moment of humility that I think authenticity can really lead. Mm. And, and, and the other thing, so that's, that's one thing I do consistently every week. The other thing I do to maintain that passion and authenticity is when I go before the church, if I'm not feeling it that week, and you know, there's, there's some weeks that you're excited about worshiping together. Yeah. And you look around and you're like, here we go. And there's other weeks you're like, why am I here again? And it's in those moments that I think it's critical as a leader that you allow yourself to be vulnerable in front of the people that God's given you to lead. And you say, guys, honestly, I'm not feeling it today. Whatever that warm fuzzy is that I get oftentimes when I get to worship with you, it's not there today. But I love you and I love the Lord. And I believe he's brought us here for a reason. And so would you join me in worshiping him? Whether you're there with me where you're not feeling it or you came ready this morning, let's go to the throne together. And it's then that there's something authentic, even if I'm not overly passionate in that moment. So, yeah, that's those are two things, the way I relate to the Lord, the re way I relate to the congregation. Yeah. To continue to lead with authenticity. So. I think that authenticity... Uh, that, that's one of those like intangibles that maybe people don't recognize when it happens, how much mm -hmm. that influences the way that um, we engage with a worship leader. I remember at one point I was um, attending a conference and there was a lady wor who was leading worship. And I have this, I'm, I'm really bad about this, I admit it, but like <laughs> she was not the greatest musician, right? Yeah. And, and it kind of bothered me as a guitarist, like she, and, but she was so passionate. It mm. kind of, that kind of went over my head at the time. Mm. Um, and like, I had a hard time, but I remember at the end of the conference, everybody was just going up to her and be like, that was awesome. Yeah. That was amazing. And I'm like, well, what did I miss? What did I, <laughs> what did I miss? And it, I think it was those intangibles, like that authenticity that she brought that I honestly lack a lot of times because I'm just trying to make sure that this song leads correctly into the next song yep. and, and the, the kind of the mechanics of a Sunday morning that um, I would have a hard time yeah. not, not doing that. I, I love that you mentioned that because instantly people come to mind yeah. that I've been under their leadership or I've led them who definitely are in the passion bucket or in the heart bucket, if you will, it's overflowing. Yeah. And maybe the skills, not quite. In fact, when we do auditions at our church, you know, we have we have a you know 1200 membership, plenty of people that want to be on the worship team or the worship team serve yeah. with that community. So we have auditions and what I tell people and what I really try to stick to in evaluation of how we can work together, really there's three buckets and uh, number one is heart. Do they understand what they're doing? Are they passionate about the Lord? 
Yeah. Not music, but the Lord as they lead worship. But there's another bucket called skill, and that's actually really important. Um, mm. And there's another bucket called commitment. Mm. And, I'm, and I really look for people who have enough in those buckets or are ready to fill them at least so that we can work together. But I'm with you. I think when that hard bucket is overflowing, um, it's kind of like love covers a multitude of sins. It's yeah. like a heart for the Lord covers a multitude of musical sins. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I definitely appreciate it at the right places. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So when it comes to music in the church, I know that for a lot of the congregate, like, I know this is just maybe I should only speak for myself. Like there are so many times where I'll sing through a song and and like I honestly hadn't stopped to read the lyrics of that song in so long, right? It's just become so much a part of. Mm -hmm. So when you are choosing songs and when you're thinking about songs, how much of the actual message of the song are you are you thinking about? Um, yeah, does that does that really play into it? Man, what a great question. Um... I think it's really important right now that every worship leader, worship pastor, what have you, um, is in tune with this right here. What are we singing? What are we saying? Does it align with Scripture? Of course, as we understand it, as our um, doctrine has, has laid it out, um, but is it accurate to who we are as a community to resonate um, as well? And if we don't do that, if, if we're just listening for the songs that sound cool, um, yeah, I think we've missed something greatly. But I do think it's more than just this song has good lyrics. I think it is this song is, is aligning with the heart of this church community, is mm -hmm. drawing us to God. Um, and so I think I think we should take the time to... In, in fact, uh, there's there's a website called the Berean Test. Have okay. you heard of this? I haven't. No, it's so good. I have to look it up. Um, but what he does is he evaluates all the songs that that come out, and pretty much every song I've ever needed to go check on. And he's and again, I don't remember this guy's name. Um, it's terrible. <laughs> I'll put but, it on the screen or something while we're. But talking. the Berean Test, yes, and he he pulls out every line. He pulls out the thoughts of every verse and every chorus, and he weighs it against Scripture. And he gives his own scorecard of how that would match up to a biblical um, uh, writing. But also, is it understood by a modern congregation? Is it understood? How, would it be understandable by someone who doesn't go to church, um, who doesn't know the Lord? And so it's a great place for me to interact with someone on how accurate this stuff is and how valuable it is to the church community right now. So I, I use that for every song, just to have that conversation with someone, if you yeah. will. Um, there's one other side to that question of how important are the lyrics and the accuracy and that stuff and the content of the song. And that is, at our church, um, Wood Creek Church in, in Texas, um, we have a preaching team. Mm -hmm. This is really cool. So we've moved away from the senior pastor model. Our model is a teaching team, and uh, there's there's six of us that will teach regularly, and then there's others who represent other parts of the staff that are even on that team to bring input mm -hmm. and to share with us and to hold us accountable. Yeah. Well, what it does for me as a worship arts pastor to be on the preaching team and to evaluate previous messages and to work on and hold one another accountable to future messages is I know where the heart of our preaching team is mm -hmm. going. And so as I'm pulling together songs, um, not only is, is it great if it's applicable to that Sunday's message, but I also know where we're headed. Yeah. And so it's been so helpful for me to gather music that speaks to the heart of where God is taking us in the teaching. And so I encourage all worship pastors to be connected with that preaching team or that senior pastor, whoever it is that's guiding the direction of the content of the messages as well. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to scripture um, and memorizing scripture, like we've, I've talked about on this channel a lot and the podcast about how like there are a lot of different mnemonics that people use. Yeah. And one of the most effective and easiest for most people is music. music. 
right? I mean, it's something like we still remember. I, th- I can't remember what song that you and I were talking about. It was a Malachi. Uh, Micah 6 8. Micah. Okay, yeah. Where it's like you start singing that, and anybody who grew up in mm. the church is going to just start going with you because he has shown, shown thee. Yeah. Oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires, requires of thee. thee. Yeah. And and so just having put that to melody, yeah. a lot of us are are able to then internalize that so much quicker. Do you think there's a role in worship uh, with I don't even know if it's within a congregation or it like right now it just seems like that happens on the kid level. Oh, that's and and, funny. and I don't know, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, if if that's translated much into the adult level in the songs, like I I don't know. What has that have you seen? I that? would challenge you there. Okay, I, good. I think please. I think there is a, a lot going on in the adult sphere, but you're absolutely right. It seems to be the go to for children's songs. In fact, nightly, all four of our kids will play um a scripture lullaby playlist. Yeah. And it's made up of uh, these incredible songs that help you go to sleep, but they're all word for word of obviously English translations of, mm-hmm. of scripture. And so it is so common to have it in the kids. First of all, I'll say, usually though, if it's in the kids' sphere, it's still getting into the hearts and the heads of all the parents. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're bringing it Because they're having to listen to it time and time again. Yeah. Um, but I would say, uh, gosh, and, and it's terrible because I may not have a ton of examples off the top of my head, but I do think a lot of what we're singing, or a lot, at least a lot of what we're singing at our church, yeah. um, is not only biblically accurate, but there are several phrases and sections that are word for word, mm-hmm. um, or at least thought for thought yeah. with Scripture. And if you really take a listen, um, challenge yourself to listen to what's being shared in these contemporary worship songs, it's not all just over emotional. You know, it, it gets a bad rap, I would mm-hmm. say. Um, over emotional songs um, about uh, you know dating Jesus would be the worst of it, right? <laughs> but if you really listen, I think conceptually there's some incredible stuff coming out that is very biblically accurate. That is regarding sections of scripture um, or stories of scripture. Um, you know, I, it's funny. Like the first example that comes to mind is so terrible because it's so old now, so okay. dated. But you know, Shane and Shane are so influential for uh-huh. you and for me. Yeah. And they're Psalms albums. Mm-hmm. They, they have two of them. They're incredible. May, maybe three. Do they have three? Uh, yeah, they might have more now. They yeah. have a billion worship <laughs> initiative albums. But um, I think it is happening. Yeah. I think tune in, like, like listen closely. Mm. Um, do the work of listening uh, to the lyrics of these songs. And I think you'll find a lot of scripture embedded um, yeah, I think that's a good point, and it's one that I haven't done so well. Of sometimes I, I know the song is based on a passage of scripture, mm-hmm. but I haven't done the work. Like it's not unless it's in the title of the song. I usually haven't done the that's work point. to figure out what where that's coming from. Like, mm-hmm. and and I know we do that a lot with the Psalms, um, where there there'll be something where the reference of whatever we're singing in that in that particular chorus or in the verse, like that's coming like almost directly from a Psalm, but I haven't done the work to figure out exactly mm-hmm. what it is. And you're making you, even your question is a good point that as a mnemonic tool. Mm-hmm. That's not as often utilized in the adult for, for adults yeah. music. That what's really happening in adult worship music is a synthesis of what we're learning from scripture, what we're learning as we live this life, and, and yeah. piecing these things together. And what you'll usually find more s- scriptural imagery or scriptural short quotation, but not necessarily word here's for here's word. here's this. If I know this song, I know this entire passage. Yeah. Right. Um, with a few exceptions, like like we talked about with those yeah. Shane songs, which we did Lord of Hosts, right? And yeah. um, I went back and looked at it after talking with you. Like, okay, Psalm 146, Lord of Hosts. And then I was like, oh, it isn't really word for word, is no, it? No, it's not. <laughs> no, not at all. But they at least call it Psalm 146. So you're like, okay, I, I can go back now and connect how this song really is the heart of this passage, right? Yeah. And it takes me to Scripture. Yes. So. Yeah, maybe a word of wisdom for uh, or a suggestion for writers out there. If you're going to borrow heavily or be inspired by a passage of Scripture, include it in your title because yeah. it points people back to the Word. Yeah, it really does. 
I remember, I think it was Ross King who put out an album of, of like word for word. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not nearly as singable as, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I think that's... Well, what... you know, Hebrew poetry <laughs> and English poetry don't always play nice together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm going to move off of just for a moment off of um, like the music side of stuff. But like there are so many different spiritual disciplines that we as as believers and and even as a, a church can encourage into right you've got um you got communion you've got fasting you've got you know obviously daily time in the word fellowship and all that stuff and i i wrestle with it like i i'm not trying to lead into this question but it's like what what role do you think scripture memorization hmm. if any has in like a in a church setting nowadays? Is that, is it something mm. we've lost? Is it something that is really important? Because I've talked about, it's, it's, the Bible isn't overly explicit about, hey, you need to, it talks about write it on your heart. Like there's a lot of things that we can use that, that yeah. we understand that as. And the example of, of Christ. Jesus, correct. Right. Um, you asked a few questions. Okay. I'll, I'm I'll kind of start at the end and go right. backwards. Yeah. Uh, is it important? Absolutely. I, I can't imagine thinking it wouldn't be important. Yeah. Um, am I the chief of all sinners in this? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, I look at what you do and what your community does, and I'm absolutely blown away in my feeble efforts to memorize scripture. But I will say there is no question that when the scripture is in our minds and in our hearts, <laughs> which really is the same concept scripturally, Yeah. Um, when it is embedded in us uh, and we respond in scripture, not necessarily always quoting it out loud mm. or spewing it, but when we live out the scripture that's embedded in us, and not just a concept of what the scripture may be, but the actual scripture we've memorized, there's no doubt that it plays out in fruitfulness, spiritual mm. fruitfulness. And so... If that's not a definition of an important spiritual formation, then what yeah. is? That it produces spiritual fruit. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it is important. Uh, it has been set aside, um, and and almost like like you mentioned the kids, almost like, well, you you maybe you went through scripture memory as a kid, but yeah. we don't really challenge one another in that as we get older. Yeah. It's a really curious thing. Yeah. So glad you asked. Uh, maybe I need to I'd get going. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like I've loved it. We have uh, a gentleman, I won't say names necessarily, but like he's a, he's a great guy. He's an actor in mm. the congregation that, you know, I remember at one point, maybe it's been years now that he would go up and, and like, like either recite from memory something or he would do a little play or like something. And, and to me, whenever, whenever somebody recites something from memory, and I know this for myself as well, like when I've recited something that is something I've memorized, it's, it's, it's usually because I know it really well by that point. Yep. And there's something about me being able that, that it would, I, you wouldn't have if I were just reading it yes. versus reciting it that I even remember from, from this guy, well, James, that, I'll, I'll just say, yeah, yeah James. James. Uh, yeah. It brings to mind something that is so real to me right now. Um, and so if you take the practice of memorization mm -hmm. and you apply it to worship leading and music, how incredibly, how different it is mm -hmm. when you've memorized the song, the guitar part, the vocals. Yes. When you're not looking at the back screen, because you know t nowadays we have the back screen, the yes. back wall. Um, when you're not looking at your iPad in front of you, mm -hmm. um, reading the chords, but it's in here, it's in, it's in your mind and in your heart. And all of a sudden you pick your head up and you see your brothers and sisters and you see your piano player and you see the vocalist by your side. That is a different experience of worship. Um, that is a different practice of worship application of worship because the form has been put in my heart mm -hmm. and now I am practicing it with all of my presence, all yeah. of my attention. And so I would imagine that as that plays out with worship music, that also plays out in the way we worship the Lord from day to day in scripture memory, right? Yeah. 
And so really interesting. That's a good point. I, I hadn't even thought of it that way because, yeah, if I come into a Sunday morning super prepared, yep. there's so much of a difference in the way that I even get like, and, and I feel like, again, that authenticity, it, I think that they may not be able to articulate why, but I think a congregation can, can know if I'm not well prepared because I'm not getting to worship as much as if I know what I'm doing and I can, like you said, lift my head up and participate in yep. the worship with everybody as opposed to just being so focused on yeah you know, I, I think there's a really connect. interesting correlation there yeah um, that plays out in okay so how memorizing uh, these songs can help me in my engagement with a congregation and with the Lord in worship mm -hmm. how memorizing that scripture can help me engage with people around me the environment around me and the Lord when it's not something I'm needing to continue to read off the page. Yeah. But I'm reciting from the heart. It was so much fun having John join us in person in the studio. I don't get to do that very often. As a matter of fact, both he and his wife came to visit our family here in Thailand, and it was just so much fun getting to show them around. If you want to learn more about Wood Creek Church, which is where John is the worship arts pastor, then you can go to woodcreekchurch.com. And of course, we've got a number of other great interviews with people that I recommend you watch here. Or if you want to learn more about how to memorize the Bible, I've got this playlist right here. God bless.